Thanks very much, Nicholas, for that introduction and for that insightful critique of my skills as, as a comedian. <laughs> um, uh, as Nicholas mentioned, we're here doing double duty. We are here to talk about the night poles. We're here to spill the tea. We're here to quarrel. We're here to advocate. We're here to passionately plea for what is our favorite aspects of them and what is not so favorite. And um, I think now is a very uh, good time to have this discussion, not only because Naipaul died only a year ago, but this is also the centenary of the end of uh, East Indian indentureship uh, throughout British territories. And there's a lot of publications are happening talking day to have this. Today's World Press Freedom Day. And I think a huge aspect of the Naipaul legacy, if we do agree that there is such a thing, uh, is the fact that all of the Naipauls were journalists in some form or fashion. Um, whether through their fiction or in some cases through their actual reportage. Um, so joining me today is Vijay Maraj, the editor of Seepasad and Sons. Vijay is a lecturer at the University of the West Indies. Um, and um, she's, um, what? <laughs> and that's enough, she says, okay. <laughs> that's all you need to know. Um, <laughs> uh, and, um, you know, yeah. So and Kenneth Ramchand, the chairman of the Friends of Mr. Biswas, uh, which was the organization, the NGO that actually put on the conference that led to this publication. And I think it's really crucial for us to also have a writer here today because that uh, sheds an important light on the Naipaul legacy. And with us is Anton Nimlet, um, who, as Nicholas mentioned, uh, recently, um, well, actually on Sunday, will launch his new book of short stories, Now After, which contains um, a story in response to Naipaul. But of course, uh, Anton, um, your work generally, I think, has a resonance with uh, Naipaul in the sense that you deal very much with the immigrant experience. Um, and you technically, your prose style is also very clear. It's concerned with readability. I was wondering, just to start the conversation, um, in what ways did Naipaul influence you as a writer? So I kind of had this whole conversation with myself when uh, Nicholas asked me to join the panel and sort of thought about, you know, what would my role be here and how, because I'm not, an, an, I'm not a scholar, I'm not a Naipaul expert in any form or fashion, but of course the, the, there is conversations and so I examined those things. And the first thing that did come to mind was the fact that um, we both write from outside of Trinidad, um, having had the experience of, of migration um, and having some kind of urgency in, in examining and in having conversation with what that, that distance means, what the, the, the growth here means and how it translates into this other experience of, of being in another world. Um, and so there is that. And in looking at, at his work and mine, I see that and we come to very different conclusions. We have different experiences about, about that movement, but there's definitely an overlap and there's definitely a connection there that I feel and that I see. And so that was one thing. Um, the story in particular that Nicholas mentioned that's in the collection, that was an easy story for me to come to because um, when I, when I reread A House for Mr. Biswas, um, it said the settings of the, earl, of the earlier pieces especially, I, my grandmother lived in Coover. My grandmother is in County Carney. So for the past 
few days before I came up to Bocas, I was with my aunts in the house in Cuba. And there's, a, there's, there's something there that immediately catches me and pulls me in to wanting to have a conversation. So that's, that's a connection that was easy for me. Yes, and, and that idea of conversation, I should mention, um, today's event, we're, we're planning to have it very informal, and I would like any member of the audience to ask a question or raise their hand to make a comment if they'd like. Um, we thought we would... Um, so yesterday, there was a session with Marina Warner, and she was talking about the danger of myth and reputation. And I thought, how fitting, because... Naipaul, if ever there was a writer, is one of those writers whose reputation precedes them. And I think to some extent, um, and justifiably so, uh, because let's face it, he, you know, anyhow, yeah, there are some certain things that we will discuss later. Um, but I think uh, it's still important and it's often lost in the discussion about him, um, the actual work. So I thought it would be a very good idea for each of the panelists to just read their favorite paragraph from a Naipaul work, whether it's V.S. Naipaul or C. Passard Naipaul or Shiva Naipaul or any of the Naipauls. And um, so during this uh, discussion, I'll be asking them to just um, read. So I'd like to ask Ken, since you were, yeah, just right there to read what you've chosen. I thought I was going to be. Oh, oh the mic, the mic. I thought I'd be getting a reputation for being disobedient because I decided <laughs> I was going to read from C. Passard Naipaul because I got the impression that the whole thing was going to be about VS. I said, no, it can't be about VS, it has to be about. Well, I mean, that's one of the things we should talk about, isn't it? Because to what extent do all the, the Naipauls come into one, you know? But, yeah. Yeah. So I just perversely decided to not necessarily give you my favorite passage, but to give you a passage that I think um, shows, shows continuities and discontinuities between C. Passard Naipaul and his sons. Um, and the first discontinuity that will come out of my uh, reading, the first continuity, is that the character Gurudeva is a bhajan. He's a gang leader. And then, after he makes a jail, he becomes a mystic pundit. And I feel that the mystic monsieur is very much um, a descendant of the Guru Deva who became the, fake, become the fake pundit going about giving lectures in broken Hindi to people who know less Hindi than himself and giving Hindi lessons and so on. Well, Guru falls in love <laughs> with um, one of his Hindi students. And this lady called Daisy was a glamour girl in town or in Shaguanas, where the American base was. But now that the Americans have gone, she's fallen on hard times like Jean and Dinah. Um, Sipasad was actually doing Jean and Dinah long before Sparrow. Because Daisy is a Jean and Dinah. And so Sipasa, um, Guru falls in love with this lady. Can I um, put my book there and read? Yes, of course. <laughs> yes, so Guru goes to the pantry. He's all up before the pantry because he. Huh? Okay. Right. He's hauled up the, before the pantry right? because he's taking a second wife. And they tell him he can't do that. Well, he uses a lot of scholarly works to prove that the Indian gods have had several wives in the past. So they said, all right, we'll allow you to do it, provided you go and tell this woman, this Jagabat, that she has to become a Hindu and she has to live up 
to the style of nice Indian women. And Guru feels he has won a great victory. So he goes and announces to her what the decision of the Panchayat is. Um, Sipasad, more than any of the other Naipoles, wrote about women sympathetically and with understanding. And that's one of the great discontinuities with himself, between himself and his son. All through those stories where he's writing about arranged marriages, if you go and read them, they're all from the perspective of the girl. And uh, here, Daisy is responding. Daisy took a deep breath, jammed her hands against her waist, flashed a contemptuous look at Guru Deva and said, they must be nuts. Guru Deva looked pained and puzzled. Don't talk so days. If you don't do what they say, I go get in trouble. I mean, they go make me kujat. They go put me out of the punch. Think it over days. Save me from all this trouble. I give them my word that you will turn Hindu. She turned another searching look on Guru Deva and said briefly and explicitly, you must be nuts too. Guru Deva opened his eyes wide. Daisy added, me? Turn Hindu? Man, don't make me laugh. Me? Wear Gungri and Orini and Chapal and long hair. Me? Give up rouge and lipstick? You can all go to hell. I see, said Guru Deva. If you can't do as I say, you better go. Hell with you, said Daisy. And she went before the little mirror she had set up against the wall in Gurudeva's room, which was all the room she had, and began to fix her hair. Leaving Gurudeva outside, she banged the door shut. In 10 minutes, she had changed into fresh clothes, then went to work with powder, rouge, and lipstick, then packed her suitcase and flew out of the room to catch the late bus to Port of Spain. Thank you for that. Okay, so, I mean, one of the things you mentioned in your preface to that was that, you know, C. Passard wrote uh, more sympathetically about women, um, the implication being, obviously, obviously the allusion to V.S. Naipaul's quite infamous misogyny. You know, he famously declared, or infamously declared, that he could tell when he was reading a woman writer because a woman, women are inferior writers and stuff like that. So today's um, discussion is the Naipaul inheritance, the Naipaul legacy. Uh, can we reconcile this idea of the Naipaul's uh, producing something valuable? And perhaps you should narrow it to video in this instance with the clear fact that you know, there's a troubled and problematic relationship between the work and the output that they created and some of their positions that they took, uh, and that video took in uh, his interviews and even in some of his depictions of his fictional characters, particularly his treatment of women characters. So I'd like everyone to address that. Maybe Vijay could start with that. I knew just because of how I look, I would have to address Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> oh dear. Um, what am I supposed to address, Andre? Should that, we? That Professor Ramchand didn't say Gungri properly. <laughs> you know what I mean? What is Gungri basically, anyway? Basically, <laughs> should we care about the Naipauls or should we care about VS Naipaul knowing that he was such a twat? Oh, that's a good way to put it. Um, but you see, I'd have to break that whole thing up. Should we care about V.S. Naipaul? And I will have to put the rest of the statement aside for a moment. So I'll have to stop right there. Should we care about V.S. Naipaul? Because the answer to that is yes. Uh, for 
myriad reasons. Do we have the rest of the night? Can we go black box hours here and let me finish at two o'clock? Let's bring out the bottles and start talking, right? Because for myriad reasons, for the very first book that he wrote, The Mystic Monsieur, and how that speaks to us in a number of ways, right down to the last book, Magic Seeds, which continue to look at the uh, idealism associated with a revolutionary consciousness and the duplicitousness of the position. So yeah, Naipaul is important. About him being a twat, I have no knowledge at all. You know, I mean... Yes, a twat. I don't know what... Sorry, I should have been more specific. A misogynist. Um, <laughs> one of... <laughs> You know, one of the things Carol Phillips, the novelist, he was just, he just had a session here and he was talking about, you know, his own personal belief uh, uh, when it comes to the duties of a novelist. And one of the duties he mentioned was doing justice to the times, telling truth about the times. And, you know, and I guess that's, that's, the, that's why I'm formulating the question like that, because I'm, I'm wondering, you know, could someone like Naipaul happen again today um, with those uh, highly contentious positions? I, I'm afraid that people like Naipaul happen in, in that sense all the time. That doesn't change. We have, you know, brilliant artists who do some really messed up things in their personal life. I mean, I won't name any names. Um, <laughs> but, but, and so for me, in thinking about that question, I think about it in the sense of what has his work done. And it's one of the things is, is this legacy that we're talking about, and I think it is there. I think for me, what it is, it's establishing space. It's created, it's created space for us to have a conversation like this. It's created, it's created space for a, a literary festival like this to exist in Trinidad. I mean, I don't think it's a long leap to go from V.S. Naipaul in the world to having Bocas Lit Fest in Trinidad year after year doing amazing things. To go from there to me being able to say, I'm going to write and I want to write this thing. Um, so, but that, that, it's tough to do the separation when we get into some really twat-like behavior, if you will. That's gonna be our watchword, our callback word That's perhaps. That's a sound bite for this event. Um, <laughs> But, but for me, that's how I resolve it. And that's, that's, that's how I look at it. Um, I'd like to take that question, um, Andre. I think that you're quite right. Uh, in our present times, because you're talking about freedom of speech and today being so important in that regard. And um, I think that while we talk a great deal about freedom of speech now, and we insist upon it, that very insistence would not allow somebody like Naipaul to emerge again, because we have such strong discipline and boundaries about what can be said, what is appropriate to say, and what is not. I think writers of an earlier generation had an easier time in that regard, because there weren't these very strong, um, yeah, somebody saying something, come on, talk to us. <laughs> yeah, so I think that a Naipaul cannot cannot arise again. Some people sent me a letter asking me whether I could write a piece at short notice on does Naipaul hate Trinidad? So I sent off an email to them right away, here it is, with the attachment. So they opened the attachment and then they wrote back and said, well, um, but could we have something longer than that? Because my the article I sent them was, so what? <laughs> so what? I have written Miguel Street. I have written a house for Mr. Viswas. I have written a bend in the river. And um, I'm a foul thief. It don't matter. I hate women. That didn't spoil my writing. So you make a distinction between when we get Alzheimer, Alzheimer's, and we forget everything about V.S. Naipaul and Trinidad, and we read the books. Make a distinction between that blessed time 
when we forget all that biographical stuff and all that contextual, socio-political, racial stuff, and you're reading a book for pleasure, right? Just think of that time, and then you know that it really is impertinent to ask the kind of question, of, does he hate Trinidad, does he love Trinidad, is he a misogynist, is he a, a what? A twit or a twat? <laughs> yeah. yeah, ask all them kind of thing, right? Um, I, I think the, I, I can't say the questions unimportant to me. The questions are important to me about what all these other things mean. I won't go so far to say that that throws the work out. And in thinking about it, one of the things that came to me is sort of, okay, in talking about how he feels about Trinidad, right? So I will, I'll say, let's say he said it, right? He's, he, the reason the question is asked is because there's enough stuff out there discussing it. So let's say he does hate Trinidad. And what I find, though, is that in his work, he actually creates a Trinidad for us now by not only by doing the works that you cited that talk beautifully and leave us legacies about how he captured Trinidad, but in his whole body of work, in his existence, he creates this space, this, this place, again, I come back to creating space, he's created for us this legacy in the world that says, yeah, he hated Trinidad, but here's what he's left Trinidad. Um, and I'm not sure how that translates in terms of his relationship with well, women. Let me not block anybody answering it, but just to say, that I did comply with the people, and I wrote the piece about how Na does Naipaul hate Trinidad, and uh, what I tried to show was that he, even while he was saying, I hate Trinidad, he was obsessed and in love with Trinidad, and any one single statement about his attitude to Trinidad is not his whole view of Trinidad, and you get what he really feels about Trinidad from the fact that all his life, although he hated, he only Trinidad gave him a big tabanka. He just could not <laughs> wipe out Trinidad from his conscience. He's writing about it all the time. I think Prof and he, mm. Professor Kajo, I think. He took the guard to Trinity Cross. He was there with Wally, um, with, uh, Willie Chen. Willie was also honored. And Willie said, tears came to Naipaul's eyes. So I think to, 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 the, the, uh, the hate and love is, is, I think the word is, uh, he had an ambivalent relationship with the country. And of course, that came through in different kinds of ways. But I think as Ken says, you hate something, we're always writing about it. You go, you come. So I don't think it's, I don't think, let me say, no, he did not hate Trinidad. I would say he had an ambivalent relationship with Trinidad, and I think from that point of view, we have to take him. More importantly, precisely because of ambivalence, we have the richest literature. It comes out of ambivalence. It's not, a, I like you, I hate you, what is that? So I think it's a false question. It's a false premise. If you start with a false, false premise, we end up with a false answer, and it doesn't take us any place. Naipaul had a rather ambivalent relationship with Trinidad. He was quintessentially Trinidad, born his rejection is accepted. Mm -hmm. And yet, yet, in this day and age where we have the internet, we have social media, we have thousands of amazing books, this literary festival is an example. We have so many incredible novelists, not only from Trinidad, well, I mean, particularly from Trinidad and Tobago, we have so many great writers in our history, in our region. And yet, if we have the option, if we have so much choice, why should we prioritize a voice like Naipaul's? And just to bring the question back, we were talking about love and hate, and I'm being devil's advocate, so <laughs> don't stone me as yet, please. Um, <laughs> Just to bring the, the question back, because I, we began really about talking about a very specific thing, which was misogyny, which is quite distinct from the question of whether or not he loves or hates Trinidad, which I, I mean, I didn't actually pose. Um, it's not only misogyny 
you see. The problem is there are other aspects of this work that are uncomfortable. And I think, I mean, one of the things I discussed in my essay in this uh, collection is how I, I actually trace Naipaul's treatment of gay characters in his work and how there's a, a kind of an underlying homophobia there that's manifested. And I, I, don't, I don't think it's too much of a stretch to say that uh, um, my reading is, 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 is a leap because he actually did say homophobic things. And so I was thinking, one of the things I noticed, Anton, in your story in response to House of Mr. Biss was, was how your story was peopled with queer characters. And I was wondering, I mean, what, what was going through your mind when you were doing this in response particularly to Naipaul? So I think that's kind of something that was not a direct line in my thought process in creating the story. Um, so the story definitely, the, the central characters are two men, one Afro-Trinidadian, one Indo-Trinidadian, who meet as boys in the Coover region and then meet again 45 years later. Um, and and, and there's, there's a relationship between them that's a sexual relationship. Um, the the choice to do that is 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 interesting for me because all the other stories in the book do speak to other established works. There's Loveless and there are American writers and British writers, um, and in most cases, the stories in take characters from act, the actual work and continue with those characters' lives imagined in some different way. With Naipaul for me, as much as I was connected to Biswas, as much as it made me want to write it, a story that became this story, the connection is fractured in the way that I created a whole new set of characters. And what I did was place them in similar geography and then sort of imagine them in similar points of their life, in similar life circumstances. But I think just the choice, and it wasn't conscious at the time, to use different characters speaks to how I'm connected to Naipaul and how I'm also distanced from it. And part of that might be what you're talking about in terms of, certainly it's in terms of his relationship to country, but it's also perhaps in terms of his relationship to his feelings about homosexuality or women or anything as much. So I want to um, say something here, Andre, because I think when I said that um, we have a number of boundaries, conceptual boundaries and things like that, that will not allow another um, Naipaul to come to the fore, that is precisely what I'm talking about. So that perhaps what Anton has attempted to do, and I'm sorry, I haven't read the story I planned to, but I didn't get around to it yet. Um, what, and what you've said that you tried to do in the story is perhaps all that writers can do now because we have terms today like misogyny and homophobia that are sticks within which people must, or maybe not sticks, just lines within which the current group of writers must write, whereas before Naipaul didn't have those. This is retrospective. Me, were you saying that at present, certain boundaries have been set, certain lines have been drawn? Yes, rightly and so. If somebody, like a new a person came writing contra everything in the way he does, that he would not be accepted or he would not be prioritized? He couldn't write in the way that Naipaul had the liberty to write. That's precisely what I'm saying. And that is the way of all words that we need you come into, you learn how to be a part of the world because you learn how your world functions and you learn how to speak within it. And that's a constant and ongoing process all of the time. I'm saying that Naipaul's world was different from our world today. But then I would just be a guerrilla and my books would go underground and there'd be a cult of Ramchand who is writing in this world. There is a cult of Ramchand. I think we're, we're talking here now about the dangers of moral relativism, whereby we are ascribing, we are turning deont deontological values or universal truths into 
cultural um, byproducts. When I think, I mean, Who's doing that? I think, well, you know, I think women have existed since the beginning of man. Yes, but we didn't have the concept of misogyny since the beginning of man. Well, we uh, have I created think, cartoons yeah. of rock. What do you call them? Mm. Slip rock. What? What are they? You know the cartoons of the Stone Age man uh, where he grabs her by the hair and drags her along. We have created those cartoons retrospectively. What do we know about how um, the caveman lived and whether he was misogynistic or not? Now, who's being culturally relativist? Whether or not... Uh, the, Somebody the... tell me I was invited to quarrel. I've given it a good shot. I feel, I feel like, I mean, whether or not the term misogyny was in vogue or not, I think it was always wrong to... Um, ascribe an inferior status to women, whether or not it was fashionable or not to say so. I don't think it changes, and I don't think it's quite correct to say that, well, you know, just because, I don't think it's correct to apologize things by saying, well, you know, in those days, it was like that. No, 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 no. I'm not apologizing for Naipaul. I don't have that right. I don't have that privilege. Um, I'm just saying that the placing people into categories, we have to be careful about what those categories are. And I want to finish by saying that many of the women that Naipaul talk about are women that one feels, so they are characters, but one feels that, you know, you have met them, that you actually know some of them. And the ones that I feel that way about, I actually like very much. And the label of misogyny does not apply to those. Perhaps I ignore the others. Perhaps it's time to hear your favorite paragraph. Okay. Well, he likes the sound of my voice, right? So that was a difficult thing for me to do because you, you all probably get the impression already that I like, um, I like all of the books. So what I did was just pull the one that was right in front of me before I came down, and here we go. So I like it because, and I like all of the writing because of what we were talking about just now, the clarity, the way that you see in a way that you would not have seen before because of having read their works, and every time I read it, I want every member of my family to, to read it too because it brings such insight to me, so here we go. Very simple, very straightforward. So he's writing this something like 20 something years after, he's recalling 20 something years after this event. I recall a fine summer afternoon, soft and blue and unportentious. It was my second year at Oxford, 1966, a year when skirts were extravagantly short, when it was fashionable for men to grow their hair long and affect a disdain for material comforts when it was almost compulsory to smoke marijuana, or pretend that you did, to find common reality weird, and to show concern about the war in Vietnam, when adventurous youth was convinced it possessed a wisdom surpassing all previous wisdoms, the best of time and the worst of times. I see myself, slim, stoop-shouldered, walking back to my rooms in college, having just been released from another unremarkable tutorial session. My feeble attempts to stitch together a point of view on the use of the inductive method in the construction of scientific hypotheses had made no perceptible impression on my tutor and had left me feeling a little jaded. Strolling along, I was neither happy nor sad. I may have been thinking how pleasant it would be to get hold of a punt to spend an hour or two on the river. Approaching Broad Street, I suddenly became aware that something peculiar was happening to me. Inexplicably, my heart had started to race, my palms to moisten with sweat, my head to swim. I realized I was terribly afraid. But afraid of what? What was there to be so afraid of on this soft blue afternoon? Dazed, barely able to maintain my balance, barely able to breathe, I huddled against the wall. The summer sky, so benign, so unthreatening, was transformed into a wheeling amphitheater of undefined menace, a maelstrom of annihilating vacuity. Staring at it wave upon wave of raw fear swept through me. 
I imagined myself a body, a nameless corpse to be picked up from the street. It was as if all the secret terrors accumulated from birth had broken loose of their chains and come upon me in one overwhelming retributive flood. How long I remained huddled against that wall I cannot say. Maybe no more than a minute or two. But it took so long to write that minute or two and to make us feel it and to make us live it. And I think that that's the beauty of all of the Naipaul's writing, that we see and we feel things and we see them in words and can therefore know them in a way that we would not have known them otherwise. You know, I mean, and one of the things I've noticed in, because uh, you've read from Shiva's book there, um, uh, one of the things I noticed and perhaps this is something I should ask everyone, particularly Ken. Um, to what extent do you think the younger brother was often writing in response to the older brother? So for example, when you look at a novel like Fireflies and the way um, Shiva Naipaul handles the motif of the house, uh, and, and well, I don't want to give away what happens in the novel, but what happens in that novel, um, I, 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 you can't come away without feeling that this entire book is a direct is in direct dialogue with the older brother's work. So, do you think? Do you sense that that was a synergy happening? A, a, a bit the of, microphone has to be. A, a little bit of the dust is now settling. Um, at, at the start. I myself was annoyed. Well, this man is trying to be a clone of Vidya. He wants to live over it. But it's not true. Not, not a clone. I, I felt as though it was more of a, almost a subversion and a critique of the older brother's work. Because, OK, I'm going to give you spoilers, spoilers about what happens in Flyerflies, right? Because first mm -hmm. of all, everyone, I think everyone knows uh, in a house where Mr. Biswas, Mr. Biswas dies, right? That's the first sentence, right? Um, and in Fireflies, we start off with a male protagonist. We think that, that is the, that's the main character. And, and then he dies halfway through the book, which I thought was, again, a brilliant thing. Because yeah. it turns out the, the, that the buried subject of Fireflies is actually the woman figure. And I thought, oh, this is a, a kind of incredible kind of commentary on Biswas and its prioritization of the male within the entire family. And also the aspiration in, in Biswas for this material possession, the house, and it's like, it's like, oh, we're searching for a house, and, and all of that symbolizes and represents. It's completely subverted in Fireflies, where after the family gets the house, she, the wife, the widow, after her husband dies, she eventually loses her house. And it's, I found that it was a very, in some ways, a very melancholic but in, incisive critique of the older brother's kind of writing. I agree with you, but there is someone who wrote about it in the collection, and I do wish she would say something. <laughs> I, I'm not sure if I really want to say something about Fireflies and um, A House for Mr. Biswas because I think um, Andre has spoken about it so eloquently. I, I would like this opportunity to go back or to go back to something that was said earlier about whether Naipaul, I, I know people don't like this topic, does he, he hate Trinidad or he is a very critical writer. He is very critical about every society he writes about. Trinidad, India, Britain, every single. And the thing is, he, is, he writes so compellingly and he, he, is, he turns a critical eye on everything. And he is not asking you to share his critical vision. He's just asking you to see it. And that's what I love about him. And is he misogynistic? Well, I'm not sure he's certainly masculinist. When you read his, his um, writing, it, it's almost like women are erased, they're, they're, they're marginalized. In this way, yes, he, he was very much a man of his time. But um, I want to pick up, Vijay, on, on something you said about how okay. um, we, we're not allowed to, to write anything now that's misogynistic, that's 
homophobic, whatever, quite right. And we're not allowed to write racist material either, quite right. Call me, call me politically correct, but I think you have to respect people regardless of their race, their gender, their sexual orientation, and so on. Okay. <laughs> I, I wanted to um, pick up on something that you, that you were saying and on what Selwyn Kaju said about um, ambivalence, right? It's, it's ambivalence, it's confusion, it's not knowing, right? And the other day I was trying to do a job on guerrillas because I don't like it. And going through it, I came across, this was for about the 12th time, eh? Naipaul's entering into the feelings of the gay character as he's talking about his feelings and affections for his boyfriend, Bryant. And at first I said, well, this is mock lyricism. Mock lyricism. But as I read it, it's not really, it's, it's not mock lyricism. That Naipaul, whatever he may think about gay relationships, was going into the kinds of affections we feel for somebody else, you know, a mate of some sort. He's going into that, and he's so caught up in it, he forgets that he don't really like this. But this one, this reminds me that Naipaul once uh, said, quite facetiously, well, possibly facetiously, we don't know, that his idea of gorillas was that it was a comedy. Uh, what? Yes. Was that it was a comedy. Yes. That yes. gorillas was a comedy. Uh, and of course, gorillas is very tone deaf in many, other, many ways. I mean, because of its, its uh, this kind of postmodern novel within the novel kind of mm. thing happening. Doesn't but don't you run away from the point I'm making, yes, yeah. that he thinks he's doing mock lyricism, but the writer is so caught up in the emotions he's writing about that he slips into actually being lyrical. Yeah, something is there. That's possibly true. And, and I think that is kind of an interesting thing to insert into the conversation about what writers are allowed to write or not allowed to write then or now. I think a writer doing the writer's work um, is about getting into the body, mind, and spirit of someone else. And when we do that well, when you get into the body, mind, and spirit of the other, um, it, it veers you away from, from all of those isms. And it's not so much that there needs to be a rule that says you can and cannot. It's that there's a discussion about saying, let's look at how you're doing this. Let's look at, at have you done the work to, to really like inhabit a character, whether it's an, a man, woman, gay, straight, you know, able-bodied, et cetera, et cetera. Let's do the work. Well, I think that's a good time for you to read your favorite paragraph. And so again, I, I, you know, it's not so much that it's a favorite paragraph, but I, it, it caught my eye. Um, in, so this is from The Mimic Man, and, and rereading this recently, I, a lot of the things we've talked about appear here in terms of how he, certainly how he looks at, at his relationship with country um, and migration, but also in terms of his, his depictions of women and, um, and of blacks versus Indians, Afro versus Indo-Caribbean people. Um, but also, um, it's even interesting because it, in Mimic Men there is, his, Ralph is the central character and his father becomes a mystic monsieur of a sort at one point. So there's all of this sort of like going on here. Um, and this passage just says, I wanted no more secrets like this. No more Saturday afternoons poisoned by a feeling of shipwreck and wrongness among crowds. I had already begun, as I thought, to simplify my relationship, but I had begun too late. I was too far sunk into the taint of fantasy. I wished to make a fresh, clean start, and it was now that I resolved to abandon the shipwrecked island and all on it, and to seek my, ch my chieftainship in that real world from which, like my father, I had been cut off. The decision brought its solace. Everything about me became temporary and unimportant. 
I was, on, I was consciously holding myself back for the reality which lay elsewhere. Oh, thanks for that. You know, one of the things about the Mimic Men in particular as a novel um, is that it, it doesn't have, it's not as strongly plotted as some of um, Fidia's other books. And I was wondering about that arc within the overall, particularly within V.S. Naipaul's work, how the early work begins, uh, it's very, very funny, you know, there's a lot of like causation and stuff happening, and then the later work becomes increasingly experimental. Um, and I was wondering, well, to what extent is that um, part of the legacy, this, this idea of transgressing boundaries, transgressing form? Because, of course, you know, uh, Naipaul, and uh, this was alluded to again earlier today by Carl Phillips, um, certainly in the later books, you know, he began writing in a way um, uh, that incorporated a lot of himself um, because it was almost becoming... Um, highly autobiographical. The, the lines between the fiction and the real memoir and um, narrative, uh, sorry, uh, story was just kind of like blurring. So to what extent is that part of the Naipaul legacy? Well, I think that every writer, uh, and Anton, you can correct me here. I think that every writer wants to make a name, right? And once you have made that name, then you have the freedom to explore to your heart's content, and that is precisely what Naipaul did. I don't completely agree, however, that he shifted from um, funny and, and well-plotted solely into autobiographical and experimental. I think that that is where a way in the world, an enigma of arrival, took us. But then he did a comeback with Half Magic a Life seeds. and Magic Seeds, yeah. because he returned to the careful plotting and the careful crafting. But by the time he had gotten to um, Enigma of Arrival, he, he was sufficiently well known that he could afford to experiment. And I actually like those books more than any others, because they are so strongly philosophical. And well, I have a Kind of like well, it's liking. Even, it's even before that because it's also in a free state. Where which is yes. that even a novel? Um, um, you know. So and I, I think I think the Mimic Man in particular is also kind of like Joyce and it's kind of it's very certainly at the very least garrulous, but I mean exquisitely written, of course. Um, <laughs> you know. But his questions of all his books from the very beginning have always raised questions about the overlapping between fiction and reality. He's got these mock narrators and mock biographers of the, yeah. from the early books, as if to imply you know, that when you say you're telling your life, you are really writing a fiction. Yes. When you think you're writing a fiction to represent the truth, it, it, remember, it is, he always had that thing, and it came out more rapidly in, in some of those bad books, <laughs> um, where, you know, you could get two manifestos that show the degeneration of Naipaul as a writer, right? You, you look at the preface to the Middle Passage, where he said, in the early days when I was writing, I had no opinions, I had no ideas, I just looked around me and wrote about what I feel. Then 10 years later, he says, um, when I was young, I had no ideas about the world. I had no philosophy. Now I know the world. Now I have ideas. Now I'm a good writer. No. Now you're a good rhetorician. Mm -hmm. Because long before you write the damn thing, you know what you want to say. Okay. And all you're doing now is like a good craftsman cutting your cloth to suit the thing you know you're going to say long before. But you know, it actually comes back, I think, to the theme of synergy, which is what this collection of essays um, published by People Tree Press, and which will be available, I would imagine, after this session. Um, is all about because I think I mean one of the I think it's, is it Dix? Um, there's an essay here about um, V. S. Naipaul's late career fi fiction yeah. of self retrospect, where the argument is made for uh, even when we're looking at the later books and we we shouldn't look at them on their own. We should actually look at them as in synergy with or in direct response to the earlier work. It's almost self reflexive. And you know, so 
is it really correct for us to make this kind of distinction um, between the, the early work and the later work in that regard? Well, I think that Dix had a clear thesis, right? And he went on to show it uh, in a number of writers apart from Naipaul, that when we do the cutting, and that's the thesis he's working with, that when we do the cutting between early works and late works, then we start doing a kind of comparison. So it's like what um, Professor Kojo said earlier on, that the premise itself is false, that the early late distinction is not an, a productive one. So based on that, he was saying um, that you know, we need to take the work on its own merit, even when we are looking to see where it began and the, the trajectory that developed into it. So he's working with a particular thesis, and I think he, he argues the case very well for that. But we can afford, so it's not a matter of true or not true or correct or incorrect. It's just a matter that he's working with that thesis, and he does a good job of it. That's a fine essay. Yeah, and so well, I wouldn't argue with anyone, because I don't want to take time. Um, I, I don't agree. With the thing about early and late, right? Um, and my simple thing is that when I read a writer's work, I know, for instance, um, the early novels of Naipaul give me more pleasure than the later ones. I'm not making any distinction or theoretical point. I'm just telling you that when I have a little time to spare and I can go and read a book again, a Naipaul book, I not go in and read a way in the world, right? So why is that? That is not a theoretical thing. They're saying that we, as human beings, as readers, um, looking for something that takes us out of ourselves, something that does things to our feelings, enlarge our perspectives, and so on, we gravitate to certain books. If it happens that those books are in the early period, it is, I don't have that kind of interest to go and make a barrier between early and late, but the barrier exists, or, or the difference exists, and that difference shows itself in the pleasure that the books give you. I mean, so you know, this is a really scary conversation for a writer to hear, right? Because, <laughs> you know, you, you come into the page and you're trying to do what it is that you do and, and, and create some stories, and then it hearing the conversations about, about what, because it can almost become this thing of what you're allowed to do and what you're not allowed to do, right? Are you allowed to experiment? Are you allowed to shift position from how you used to write to how you write now and that sort of thing? Um, I think it's a great conversation to have as readers and, and as critics and, and scholars, um, but for a writer um, at the end of the day or any other artist, you know, at the end of the day, you have to kind of come to your work in this time at this moment from where you are as a person mm -hmm. in, that, in that time. Yeah. And in saying that, if we look at the tapes where we had the, um, the thing in 2007 when Naipaul came to Trinidad, you are practically saying his, maybe slight paraphrase of what he said himself. <laughs> that you approach the thing and you do your thing in that moment as best as you can. I, but here's the thing too, right? I mean, I argue strongly for that. But there's this way that he says it though that like yeah, is both people. <laughs> yeah man. He like the, the buffin, right? And and so like Nicholas calls it Pekong. And I'm like, I I always like I haven't had this conversation with Nicholas, but I'm like, is it Pekong if the other person like is not like well not just doesn't like it, but if they, they don't have the same level to come back at you, you can't yeah. Pekong, you know? Yeah, that Advantage. Yeah, right, right. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. That's downright bullying. Yeah, I mean and just going from this discussion of, I guess, hybridity into, uh, in terms of form and also um, what a writer can or cannot do, I've noticed some journalists in the room. And um, I noticed that um, I, uh, today's World Press Freedom Day, as I mentioned, and Sipasad Naipaul, yes, he wrote uh, the short stories, but he was also a journalist. And to what extent did that, the rigors of that, that what that entail, um, what that entail. The rigors of what? Sorry, the rigors <laughs> diction just fell apart. The rigors of what journalism entails um, may have actually influenced um, the younger writers in terms of their outlook and approach to like just going out and saying what they want to say and doing what they want to do. Do you see a synergy, a link between the you know the fathers 
career and the the attitude almost of the younger writers. Well, you're working on that book right now. <laughs> attitude, um, um, and I'm missing the question really. The, the so basically, I mean, Sipasad was a reporter. So, like, did that inspire his children? Did that inspire his children? Children. Children. Oh, well, well I, I think that is taken for granted. Yeah. Um, and video. But in what in, ways? In what ways can we find that? In what ways can we find that in the work? Well, you, you want something very simple because it's there in the way in which the stories are told. It's there in the way the dialogue is used. Is it there in the way in which people are described? Um, it's in the conventional ways in which one writer influences another, yeah. but also in the deeper senses, my daddy was a writer, my father was a writer, and I have a feeling it's in my genes. I want to be a writer too. The ambition to be a writer, to be part of a tradition, um, he may well have inspired them because a lot of people say, because of ignorance, we don't know that there is a great tradition of West Indian writing. But the people in that family were able to get a sense of tradition because their father was a writer. And he had a library where he used to read things to them from other writers in the world. So um, C. Passard created a context in which his children felt that writing could be a profession. As, as V.S. himself always said, um, it was, he was given the feeling that it was a noble calling. Yeah. And um, even in the little piece that I read here, I think that um, you can see that journalist style of writing. You know, it's a careful recording of each moment that um, is happening in it. And in the collection, the Sipasad and Sons, Arnold Rampasad wrote about his father, about Jerome Rampasad. And if, if you're looking for another kind of um, inheritance going on there, and the way the father and son thing passes along, um, uh, if you look at Arnold's biographies that he has written, it's very like what his father wrote for the newspapers. So there is always that linkage. What you've seen and what you've inherited, you kind of reproduce. Andre. Um, Bo Tiwari wrote a piece about the family synergies in the book. I don't know why he's keeping quiet. Yeah. <laughs> but first, we, we have a comment from the audience. So let's don't forget that um, Naipaul did some very serious, rigorous journalism, especially in the 70s and maybe 80s. Abdul he was, Malik. Yeah, well, beyond that, he was, well, that was an obvious one, but he was hired by the um, British and American press to go to Argentina and send dispatches and explain what happened. He was hired to go to Africa. He was hired to, you know, sometimes come to the United States and make, make sense out of what was happening there. And that took, one thing as someone who, you know, has read a lot of his work, one thing I'm always struck by is the fact that he was a, you know, a very, very rigorous journalist who had amazing powers of observation. I mean, uh, um, um, among the believers, that is just deep reporting, right? I, I just want to be a, li a little careful about saying that they hired him and sent him in those places. Naipaul is a much more calculating fellow than that. He looked at Trinidad. You see, he had Muslims, right? You see, he has white people. You see, he has, you see, he has Africans. And Naipaul didn't wait for them to say, let us pay you to go to Africa. He would say, pay me to go to Africa now. He was tracking the ancestral lands of his fellow Trinidadians, right? In, in, in that kind of journalism. And so he had more than just the motive of writing about a different country. He's writing about a country from which the people are my fellow countrymen now. I mean, and, and that gives a kind of... That, that's fine, but he was drafting on news events. Yeah. That's what I was saying. Uh-huh. I've also spotted Nicholas is in the room, and um, Nicholas Lachlan is also a contributor to this uh, collection. And um, one of the things I wanted to touch on is 
When we say Naipaul, I think uh, we tend to think of the three men. Uh, if, we, if we think beyond video, we think of the three men, but of course, the Naipaul name includes also Savi Naipaul Akal, who, who, um, yes, who launched her me uh, memoir right in this room last year, I think, the Naipauls of Nepal Street. And, um, and one of the things uh, Nicholas also teases out in his essay in this book um, is the prospect of other female Naipaul uh, voices. And I was, I guess this brings us full circle back to that um, contentious question in the beginning. But though, I mean, should we, to what extent should we also um, be mindful of that nuance in the Naipaul legacy? Yeah, we need to add the women. And we have, um, I don't know why Dr. Tiwari and Professor Morgan aren't jumping in. I've been trying to tease you since I started talking <laughs> <laughs> into saying something because your essay is one of the most beautiful ones about devouring women. Talk up, talk up. <laughs> Yes, after years of puzzling about some of the issues, particularly Naipaul's um, position in relation to women, I have come to, um, to a notion that, um, that even though Naipaul appears to write about a patriarchal society in a male-dominated society, there's a, there's a very, very powerful role for women, either needy like the, like the wife in, 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 in Biswas, or these huge, uh, larger-than-life matriarchs that govern, like Mrs. Tulsi, and and in that in in that governance they become you know almost suffocating. And and my reading of it is that Hanuman House itself becomes that kind of suffocating, nurturing mother, both a kind of womb that 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 takes back the the uh, Biswas when he needs it but also a, a suffocating presence that will not allow the individuality and the masculinity to surface. So I say ambivalence, I very much agree with Selwyn's um, notion of Naipaul's ambivalence, and that ambivalence spreads to practically everything, particularly himself. I think Naipaul was very ambivalent ab about himself, about women, about Trinidad, about the world, about Oxford, about everything. And also a very peculiar, almost fear, I would say almost fear of femaleness and, and its power to engulf like a womb. That there's a line in which she says, uh, put me back, um, you're feeling my finger like Hansel and Gretel, you know, that kind of line. Put me back, I'm not fat enough yet. I'm not ready for you to eat me yet. So it's that kind of fear of engulfment that we see in relation to his women. Well, the father was forced to make a sacrifice to Kali, so I suppose Woman was Kali to him. Remember, um, in the um, in the volume Santosh. Was yes. It, yeah? Yes. The Hubji. Yes. Uh, that the, is that is Kali. And the Hubji <laughs> is yes, um, the, the Kali figure mm -hmm. uh, who who engulfs, he eats. Um, yeah. Who who the the, the, the portrayal was that the Hubji causes the man to have sex with her. Yes. And, and, and practically eats him in the second Yes, and act. talk about how the smell that and empowered that. him. No, no, but he, she was big and he was small, oh, and God. she played with him like if he was a like little puppy too, you know. That's right. Yeah, there, there, there's some stuff there. So when we talk about just the, the misogyny and the hatred of women, that's, mm. that, that, yeah. that's very complicated. Mm. No, no, it's far more complicated. There's mm. tremendous fear of femaleness and the power mm. of femaleness in, 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 in that runs right through the world. I think if all of us were more con honest, eh, we would understand how complex and ambivalent and contradictory and confused we all are, and we're just trying our best to walk as if things are all right. But um, I think all your creativity comes out of ha being in that condition. And, and that is why he was so prolific, that things were always churning around in him and he could never pin the world down and say, this is how it is. Yeah, so does that happen to you, Anthony? I, once I asked him, and even about his writing, he's ambivalent, although that is the one thing that I think he really held on to from day one, the writing. Because one day we were talking, I, I didn't talk to him plenty, but one, on one of the occasions, 
we had had a few drinks and thing, and I, I didn't. I use it. I didn't use. I use obscene language. I wouldn't use it here. <laughs> what I said to him: If so and 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 so, all the negative things you're saying, why don't you kill yourself? And he paused, and all the time he was trying to talk dialect, but now he ain't talking dialect. He paused. He says, "One has one's writing." One has one's writing, right? One always has one's writing, whatever it is, right? No, I mean, I, so Vijay asked me if that happens to me, and I think, I think that's kind of the genesis for like most great art, like trying to puzzle through the questions that bother you as you go through life. And there, God knows there are enough of those. Um, and so in many ways, you know, writers come to, to the page and they come to the craft, out of the sense of like desperation at times, out of the sense that there's some kind of therapy. And so, yeah, when we talk about the relationship to women or the relationship to country, you, you do see the grappling with ideas, the grappling with, with the complexity of it. Um, I have to go back to the point though about the fear versus the misogyny, because the way, I, the way I see it is that oftentimes fear is at the root of many of the RGs, you know? Okay. Uh, you know, fear, fear is at the root of, yes. of much of what racism is. Yeah. Fear is at the root of misogyny. So I don't, I, I don't want to let that piece slip. Okay. I mean, you know, I think it's important to call it out and to, to say what it is. I don't disagree at all. And you've cited, you know, the reasons, but I think there's a connection there in a different way. Yeah, and I think um, one of the questions that is being asked here generally in this discussion is, well, should we care about a writer's personal life? Should that at the end of the day taint or, or, or apply a lens or filter on what or how we come to appreciate that uh, writer? And I think maybe that's a question I'd like to open up to the entire audience or um, to anyone else who wants to say something or has a question. Yeah, one, one of the things that's been going through my head in, in terms of a lot, lot of the discussion, particularly the one about, did Naipaul hate Trinidad? And you think, did James Joyce hate Ireland? <laughs> and, and it's an absurd kind of thing, you know, that he, if he spent his life writing about Ireland, Naipaul spent most of his life writing about Trinidad. And, you know, so, I, the, you know, and I think you can mention them. I mean, I... Joyce is the person I would go back to most often, but you know you can mention Naipaul and Joyce in the same sentence without any kind of you know thinking that they're improperly connected. So that's that, that's kind of one kind of point. The other the other kind of point just it's not quite to do with with the Naipaul thing, but as I mean one of the things that as a publisher that I mean one of the books we've d done recently is by a young Jamaican writer writing about the construction of misogyny through schooling and things, and the construction of homophobia. And it's kind of like, you know, one, the, the, there's a delicate kind of thing, you, you know, that he has to sail near the wind in terms of expressing and exploring homophobic ideas, expressing and exploring misogynist ideas. Nobody would want to read a novel where, that preached misogyny is wrong. I think it's much more rewarding to explore how, how, a, how a writer recognizes the roots of misogyny in himself and in the kind of world that he's, he's grown up in. And it, I mean, but it, surely it, there's it, a difference between being uh, didactic in your novel sure, and, sure. and a novel that actually manifests but it, things. But there's an, ele you know, there's an element of risk and, and, and one of the things, you know, that uh, one, I mean, it's one of the say, a re female reviewer first emailed me and said, I can't review this book. It, it's horrifying me. I, I just can't bear, you know. So I said, look. I want to read that book. <laughs> but, but persist, persist with it. Persist with it. And she did. And she thought it was one of the most important books she'd read. Yeah. But it, 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 it's on that basis of, you know, is this a book which is actually expressing misogynist ideas or is it a book which is exploring the basis of how it's created. And I think, you know, the, the, that kind of risk-taking r should remain part of how writers can, can, can explore ideas. 
just a quick response. If, <laughs> if V.S. Naipaul was not the kind of person that we now have a sense of who he was, would we have had the body of work that we now have? So I would say if the answer to that is no, we would not. I mean, it took that person to give us that body of work. We would have to say that you have to take both together. If you want to be judgmental about one or the other, you can, but it really doesn't make any difference to him. Nor does it make any difference to the quality of the work that he has given and the capacity of that work to be engaged in different ways by different people who have different kinds of lives and may bring either their feelings or their intellect or their disposition to what they read or all of these things. So, I, I, it depends on, on how you view this business of literary creation or, or creation generally. I mean, if you go, I mean, you, you can't have these things and have good guys and saints and, I mean, you have to take people as they are and you get the body of work that they produce. You have another comment. I would actually go a step beyond that and say, whatever is the psychic disease, whatever is the social or cultural malaise that produces um, uh, these, what you may call certain, if you want to call them antisocial tendencies or expressions, it's not his alone, it's we own, if you know what I mean. Because so many of us share whatever is the dynamic that has produced him and that there's no clearer portrayal, sustained portrayal of a particular mindset, of a particular sense of um, dislocation in the world, um, a particular sense of skin does not fitness, you know, we can call it that, that comes out of, of, of a genius like that. And if we want to understand where we are in, in certain facets of ourselves, then we, be, we should be enormously grateful to him, even if he does not make us comfortable, even if he does not make us happy. On that note, I'd like to thank all of you for participating in this discussion, and I would like to invite you to give a round of applause to our panelists. A little programming note, anyone interested uh, at the Avery Room at 6 o'clock, Arena presents The Strange Luck of V.S. Naipaul will be screening. And uh, later tonight at the Big Black Box uh, in Woodbrook, it's going to be a great night of fiction and uh, poetry, so you can see who are the inheritors of the Naipaul inheritance. And I wanted to end this entire session where it began, which was actually with the work. So I don't know if you'll just indulge me. I'm just going to read my favorite paragraph. So this is from Fireflies. The removal van came late one afternoon. Mrs. Lutchman stood on the pavement and supervised the packing. Mrs. McIntosh, a neighbor, rocked on her veranda, staring coldly at her. Rover, the dog, who had not been in a car before, gave her a great deal of trouble, and in the end, they had to put him in a box. He whined. When the house had been emptied, Mrs. Lutchman took a final turn around the yard and bade farewell to the two avocado trees and the roses. The sun lit up the stolid, rectangular front of the house. It was a bit more cracked and weathered than when they had first come, but all in all, it had survived the years well. Her ambition to repaint it white had never been realized. 
she lingered for a moment by the front gate and pictured her husband as he was on the day he had died. A straw hat sat rakishly over his head, his dark face staring up at her and trying to dissuade her from leaving him alone. And before him on the ground, stalks of anthurium lilies and a pair of shares. Mrs. Lutchman bowed her head, then walked quickly out of the yard and climbed into the van.